absolutely ashamed to be a Westerner today. What in God's name do you think you people are doing drip feeding and delaying this desperately needed ammunition for Ukraine? I'm talking to all Western governments today. I'm a medic in Ukraine and we are shitting ourselves over here. The fucking front line is crumbling left, right and centre. How dare you dilly and dally like this? Imagine these were your children being butchered out here. Put yourself in Ukrainian shoes for once. Get your act together, man. Your policies and your bullshit. Fucking support this country. We are being terminated, exterminated. I'm ashamed to be a Westerner. I ask you why you joined um, the Ukrainian army. What compelled you to join? What compelled me? Um, uh, it's a. Uh, I'm a father and an ex policeman. And when at the beginning of the uh, full scale invasion, I was in my apartment in London. My mother had come from South Africa to spend six months with me, um, and she was here for two months. And I saw on TV children being murdered. Uh, on TV, I saw the news of children being murdered. As a father, my protective instincts kicked in. I shouted upstairs to my mother, Mom, I'm going to Ukraine. And uh, that was my, my my driving reason to come to Ukraine, was to come protect the children of Ukraine so that not more parents have to go through that pain of losing a child because I saw some horrible stories. And uh, and that's why, I, that, that's my comp that's my driving reason for being here. Wow. How, how old are you? Uh, are your kids? I'm 49 and my daughter is 15 years old okay okay um do you have any personal connection to ukraine no not at all um uh, although that uh, i have developed a saying vitora ya bu britansem sohodnia ya ukrainets um i love oh. your country and i love your culture and i love your soul connection everybody's got this beautiful soul soulful beautiful pure clean hearted there's, there's an incredible, peaceful, soulful connection in amongst Ukrainians. I know you guys know what I'm talking about. It's difficult to describe to Westerners, but it's in the way you cook. It's in the way you speak. It's in the way you sing. And uh, Ukraine is just a, a delightfully wonderful nation. And uh, I think I've been connected to you guys, to Ukraine, since long before I was born. So I think there's something there, but I can't put it into words. <laughs> That's amazing. So no connection prior to no, you just saw Nothing. what was happening and were compelled to join. Wow. Yes. Okay. Uh, standing. Yeah, it was a it was. Yeah, that's literally it. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so um, may I ask you where you're serving, if that's safe to tell? Yes, uh, uh, so I can. I have to be vague about it. I'm, I'm in east outside Bakhmut somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, okay, is, okay. Uh, is, is the safest uh, answer I can give you there, if that's OK. Okay, um, yeah. but but you're not with the International Legion. It's with some other. No, I'm no, I'm with I'm with Zesu. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, could you tell us what your daily job is and how long you've been doing it? Absolutely. Uh, my daily job is a medic. I'm a medic. I'm a medic instructor, and I'm a combat medic. My 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 main my 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 my, my biggest part of my job is being a medic, uh, rescuing wounded soldiers from zero. And uh, and evacuating them to safety. We call it casivac, casualty evacuation, mm -hmm. and um, and and also arranging supplies of wound of, of of medicine and delivering medical supplies and helping to help. You know, I'm not just uh, I've, I've I've only been a con I've only been in Zesu officially for a, for a few months, um, a few short months, three months. But uh, all my time in Ukraine, I've been a volunteer. I've been a volunteer medic through. I run a charity with my co-director Halina. It's called Project Constantine. Um, this is my patch, and uh, yeah. I'll hold it up to your camera. You, you probably heard of us. Um, and uh, it's a it's a frontline medivac service um, okay. volunteer organization. We're a registered charity in Ukraine. And uh, for a year before a year and a half before I joined the army, we were evacuating soldiers out of Bakhmut and uh, yeah. Kriminalis. And um, and I've been I've been. So I got a lot of medical experience there, and uh, and then the army invited me to join to do the same job here. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. so Project Constantine still continues to provide uh, vehicles. Dro- uh, not ve- we, we try to get drones, but they're so expensive. It's vehicles, Starlinks, generators, Blanchetta, uh, uh, Google tablets, and um, and that kind of thing. And medical supplies, of course. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. daytime medic, nighttime raising supplies for Zesu. Right. Um, did you have any medical experience before coming to Ukraine? No, none, none whatsoever. I was scared of blood. I was, I was the most squeamish person you could ever wow. imagine. I was a cab driver in London for ten years. One day, my brother died in two thousand and nine in a tragic bike accident, motorcycle accident in South Africa. I thought, I want to be a medic. I want to save people who are destitute or people who are uh, in desperate uh, need. And I went to spend a day with London ambulance, and I lasted an hour. That's my first sign of blood. I ran home. And then Ukraine happened. Um, I joined territorial defense at the beginning of the war, the full beginning of the full scale invasion. And uh, they um, there were t- two sessions of five or t- two hours each, totaling about five hours of, of TCCC com- uh, um, combat lifesaver training in the foyer of the hotel in Kreshatik in Kiev. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't very long after that they handed me the keys to an ambulance and a rifle and they said, Severe Donetsk, off you go. And uh, and the rest is history. <laughs> wow. Um, so tell us a little bit more about what you do. How do you treat the soldiers when you evacuate them from the battlefield? What's your daily life like? Um, we live, uh, so our day starts off, uh, there's usually two medics, two to three medics living uh, on, on, on duty in a bunker. Um, uh, we have Starlink and radio connections there. To the outside world we uh we get a call uh or we you hear the broadcast on the radio there's been an injured and um and we prepare ourselves we get dressed and as soon as those combat medics that are on zero with those soldiers as soon as they're able to evacuate them even just 50 70 100 two, 300 meters just out of the critically dangerous zone if they can bring them just back to us um that's me and and the project constantine volunteers Um, we will take them. We will. We will receive that wounded soldier and we'll stabilize him and uh, and make him as comfortable as can possible as possible. But it's usually a very volatile environment, and uh, it's very rapidly transported into a into a waiting four by four like this one that I'm in now. It's, uh, um, and uh, and evacuated a safe distance away from the front. Whilst we're evacuating him, we are stabilizing him and uh, working on him in the back. Um, and uh, and it's usually 10 to 15 kilometers away from the front where we will hand over to a road ambulance and uh, they will take that casualty. And if there are paramedics then in that road ambulance with more equipment, they can further stabilize if necessary. And then they deliver him into the hands of the surgeons at the nearby stabilization points. Okay, so so you treat the soldiers right in this down that you're sitting in right now? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah. It, uh, it, it, it doesn't look like an ambulance right now because it's a weekend. But uh, it's it's had the seats removed um, behind yes. me. The, the seats the seats are removed. There's one seat where the medic sits, but it's it's an open vehicle in the back, so you can okay. throw uh, push a stretcher in here. And Project Constantin is fundraising for vehicles like this to get them to the combat medics. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes, vehicles are our biggest requirement. If we could deliver ten vehicles a day, we could get rid of ten vehicles. If we could, if we were given a hundred vehicles a day, we would get rid of them all in the first hour of every day. There's just never enough. Vehicles are targeted all day long, every day by the orcs. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's a desperate, yeah. desperate, Donetsk, Donetsk roads themselves are terrible. You know, they are in terrible condition. And Donetsk, as we say, Donetsk eats cars. So it's a constant need for vehicles. You know, soldiers fight with guns and, and, and bullets. Medics fight with tourniquets and vehicles, uh-huh. uh, amb- ambulances, if you like. Uh-huh. Without our ambulances, we've got no, ambulances are our weapons. Uh-huh. So we are constantly appealing for vehicles. I've, uh, I've just made another video appeal for uh, for another 4x4 four four and another van for another battalion. It's, a, it's an endless supply, an endless need, because uh-huh. they get blown up all the time. Could you tell us about maybe the most striking experience you've had over this time and the most, uh, most uh, striking injury that you have treated? I've got both of those answers readily available. The most catastrophic injury I've seen was a 28 or 30 year old soldier who received a uh, an RPG rocket to his left thigh. The RPG was stuffed full of phosphorus, 
Oh Phosphorus God. is this horrible chemical that burns as soon as it reaches contact with the atmosphere, as soon as it can breathe. The soldier was given to me with, uh, his leg was, wasn't a leg. Um, there was, it, there was a bit of sinew holding his thigh. And I'm talking about his, his thigh ended where his groin is. And, uh, and, 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 and his leg started looking like a leg again below the knee. There was just sinew and spaghetti between the two. And I was handed the soldier in the dead of night with my red light helmet. Is the only light I had on. We're evacuating 800 meters from zero. All that was during their counteroffensive last year, and uh, and with my knife, with my big knife from my Gillette, I was cutting burning phosphorus out of this gentleman's leg, whilst holding him down, and whilst smoke is filling my cabin, and uh, and I mean, I mean the guy was before me, and I can see smoke coming out of his leg, and I'm thinking, what on earth is going on there? Because bearing in mind I'm English, and the, the medics that hand over to me this very basic ukrainian that i'm trying to receive i'm receiving instructions and information and it's there's bombs going off and we're ducking and diving and now i'm alone with this guy in the back and we're driving out of it tatiana's driving but i'm digging I'm I'm, I'm 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 digging burning phosphorus out of this poor guy's leg and he's asking me am i gonna live am i gonna be okay and i'm trying to placate him keep him calm administer drugs to take away the pain it was I've got a photo of it somewhere. I've, I've I've never been able to show anybody. It's a it's a horrible photo of his leg. Somebody took the photo as I was on, as we were unloading him to the next ambulance. But uh, it was it was terrible, terrible, terrible to have to. Not only has he been shot by an RPG in his leg, but um, he's got this enduring pain of this burning going on. It it was it was a horrible experience and. I'll never forget it. Um, so sorry. Yeah. How no, hard, thank you. Mm -hmm. This must be a terrible toll on your overall mental health. How has this all affected you? I don't know, Alia. Um, I, I, I don't. I, I genuinely don't know. I, I've become a lot. I've become a lot more impatient. I've become an impatient person. Um, I don't have time for for for. It's turned me into a, uh, I, I seek solitude a lot. I, I like to be alone a lot. And, um, and, I, and I immerse myself in, in keeping busy, but not letting, uh, to, to be alone with your thoughts is a, is a it can be traumatic. Um, but I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to make a comparison. You know, there have been soldiers in wars around the world that have, that, that are haunted by the, by the, by the, by the, by the, by the things that they've had to do and the things that they've seen in other wars and the other wars I'm referring to are wars that have been motivated by crooked politics and oil and that kind of thing. I'm not going to mention those wars because they make me want to puke, but uh, they have not been righteous wars. This is a justified self-defense. This is a justifiable action that Ukraine is engaged in. We are fighting a holy war. This is pure good versus pure evil. So I'm not traumatized, and my my brothers out there are not traumatized by the stuff that they have to get up to every day. I'm not traumatized because th there's some sort of injustice uh, um, uh, or some sort of uh, incorrect motivation behind this war. This war is completely correctly motivated. I'm talking about our self the self defense of Ukraine. But what is painful is um, is 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 the the look on on these boys' faces when they come to me and and they are half their body is missing. Some have got no arms. Some have got no hands. Some have got no jaws. Some have got no legs. Um, some have lost their entire units. And uh, and I try and give them a little bit of hope everywhere I go. Um, Project Constantine. We we created this T-shirt, um, and it's got this. Um, message on the back. I don't know if you can read it. It's in Ukrainian. It's it basically it says, "God bless you and save." God let God bless you and save you. On the front, it's Isaiah forty one ten. Fear not, for I am with you. We give these to every soldier that we cut their clothes off because we hand them off oftentimes half naked to the paramedics. And it's got a it's got a Project Constantine and a Ukraine and a British flag there together to show that the world does love Ukraine. Um. But to, to finish answering your question, I I don't know how I deal with it. I, I've I've I, I've become a lot less patient, and I don't I, and I and I and I and I don't handle bullshit easily. Um, I want to speak business, and I want to speak results, and I want to know 
if you're helping Ukraine, you can talk to me. Other than that, I've got no time for you. Um, that's literally how it's turned me into a it's turned me into a machine that is driven for solutions. Uh, that's what it's done to me. But how how it's turned how it's that's how it's turned me into a physical and mental machine to help Ukraine. I don't know how my mental state is, but it's turned me into into an effective person. So I'm, I'm quite happy with the way things are progressing right now. Um, but I, I would like to have some rest. That's for sure. Oh yeah, um, and and this brings yeah. us to to the video that you recorded. What what drove you to record such a video? Was it any si one single incident, or was it just like the general situation? It was the general situation. Um, and uh, and I will, and I need to answer that, and I need to tell you about my most harrowing experience because they're both related. Um, what drew me to make this video, Alia? Um. I watched an interview with on DW uh, Deutsche Welle. There was a broadcast on YouTube um, about an hour before that, maybe ten minutes before I, I produced that, I created this video, and I saw the pain and the desperation on my commander's face. I'm talking about my commander in chief, President Volodymyr Zelensky. And when I uh, and I've watched that man closely through, I've watched that hero closely through the stages of this war. He's a he's a true leader. He's got the most difficult job on earth. But I watched the, the 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 intense desperation and pain and suffering on his face, and it drew it drew me to want to speak out. And I was sitting on my chair at home in our in our uh, in our base, and uh, and I was and and I, and this volcano just came rushing out of my body. I picked up my phone. I ran outside. I kneeled down in the snow, and the words just came out of me. It was like I was speaking in tongues. Every day I pray for two things, Alia. I pray to God for two things. I pray for God to put my feet in a good direction. And I pray for God to bring good people into my life. And and I believe this was God asking me and telling me. Because and another thing I pray for quite regularly is for God to help me more effective than I, to help me to be more effective than I was yesterday. And if speaking at God bless me with a, a an English tongue and he God bless me with a voice. And if if one of my tools in my in my toolbox is, is is being able to speak then if i can speak for ukraine and speak for my brothers and sisters on the zero line then let me do that and uh, and so the pain the suffering the the, the 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 procrastination of western nations that are supposed to be helping ukraine stopping this tsunami of of death that's going to sweep across europe if ukraine doesn't stop it this all compelled me to make this video because uh i've got um, you know, I've got a lot of friends in the army and they message me regularly and I never, ever get any happy messages anymore. Oh, it's wow. just, it's, it's destitution and it's, and it's, and it's pain is everywhere. It's palpable. You can cut it with a knife. Um, it's, it's pain and it's frustration. And it, there's a feel, a sense of, uh, I wouldn't say hopelessness because there's a lot of fighting spirit in Ukraine, but things are for want of a better word, desperate. Um, and uh, and it's just that pain. It, I, I live with soldiers. I see soldiers every single day. I want to see happy soldiers. I want to see optimistic soldiers. I want to see soldiers that aren't somehow possessed by the knowledge that there's a very good chance that we're going to die when we go to the front because there is no artillery to back us up. I want to, be, I want to work with soldiers that are, are encouraged by the fact that, you know what, we have been spending three months on the polygon training, on the training grounds. We've got the skills to go and make a difference. Wouldn't it be great if we also had somebody with a big caliber artillery machine, 12 kilometers behind us that can back us up if we really get into trouble? Those kinds of things provide optimism. Those kinds of things help the fighting spirit. But we don't have those kinds of things. We are holding 5.45 millimeter caliber rifles and we're facing Russian rockets and jets and cluster munitions um, and artillery rounds. And we cannot stand up to it. And Ukraine does not have an infinite supply of soldiers. It's got an infinite, Ukraine does have an infinite supply of fighting spirit, but they are not an infinite supply of, of trained soldiers. So, um, yeah. What do you think will happen next? And what should Western nations be doing? What will happen next is I will go home and we will pack our bags and we will ship out tomorrow. 
Um, and we will go wherever we go tomorrow and we will carry on. Um, we will continue defending. Um, the front line is not stable, Alia. It's not a, it's not a, it's not an optimistic place. I can't, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a simple medic. I don't understand the, the entire technicalities and, and all the geography of the front line. So I can't speak professionally or with any authority on to what's going on out there, but I'm giving you the general situation out there from my friends that are reporting to me. Um, if we don't get this ammunition yesterday, then you guys better keep that ammunition for yourselves. I'm speaking to Western governments again. Don't give it to Ukraine. Keep it for yourselves because I God well, bloody well guarantee you, you're going to be using it yourselves. There's a simple, there's a mural painted on a wall somewhere. Uh, and let me just elaborate on my last sentence. If you don't give us this ammo for us to defend you, for us to defend Europe, protect Europe, you will need to keep it for yourselves because it's it's coming. It's coming. There's a mural painted on a wall somewhere. Just give us aeroplanes and artillery rounds. The rest we will do ourselves with thanks on forces of Ukraine. Just give us artillery and a few aeroplanes. The rest we'll do ourselves. Mm -hmm. There's the strongest army and the most powerful army in the world all around Ukraine. And Ukraine is walking around with its finger in the air going, bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. And we can, and we have defended it. We showed them time and time again. Kiev, we kicked their asses. Kharkiv, we kicked their asses. Kherson, we kicked their asses. We are supremely better fighters. We are defending our homeland. We are defending our families. We are defending our children. No force on earth can touch us if we have the weapons to defend ourselves. It's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. The fight inside of each Ukrainian is massive. We are fighting with matchsticks against a giant. And we keep showing them who's boss. But we are being hung out to dry. And I don't know why. I do not understand all this politics. I don't care for it. None of us do. All we care about is going home to our families and our wives and our children. And that's all that they care about is us coming home to them. And I'm sick and tired of wrapping up bodies and asking for hero bags. I changed, I used to call them body bags. I, I changed the name to hero bags. Do you know how many body bags Project Constantine has shipped? Do you know how many body bags we've delivered? Do you know how many body bags I've zipped up? I've never counted them, but I'm sick and tired of doing it. And I'm sick and tired of people using Ukrainian soldiers and using them as a, a it's like, a, I'm trying to think of an analogy here, but there isn't. A, I'm sick and tired of the world using Ukraine as a sacrificial lamb. I don't know what they're up to. Are they waiting for us to bleed Russia dry? Are, are they waiting for us to um, weaken Russia so that they can come in and claim the prize? Ukraine's not going to be around for that much longer if this continues. I want to start hearing about wild spread, wild, widespread child rape and widespread family murder whilst those children are being raped? then very soon Ukraine will be your destination. If that's where you want to witness, if that's what you want to witness, this is what will happen in Ukraine if this doesn't happen, if, if this isn't stopped. We are facing pure evil, folks. Pure, pure, pure evil, hell-bent on eradicating Ukraine. We can't do this on our own. We need your help. Ukraine is a beautiful, peaceful nation. Come on, man. We're stopping them. We're stopping them from Poland. We're stopping them from Estonia. We're stopping them from the rest of Europe. But how many of us do you want to sacrifice? Why does it have to take so long? All we want is a few artillery shells and a few aircraft. The rest we do ourselves. I'm a Christian. I pray every day. If I can encourage the rest of the world to please pray. God is love. Love is a good thing. I love Ukraine. Ukraine loves me. And that's produced some pretty damn fine results. Let's all introduce a bit of prayer and a bit of God into each of us and a bit of love that can't hurt, but also bring those damn shells. Please uh, keep supporting Ukraine. And one more little message, if I may, to Ukraine, support your army. They're the bravest boys I've ever come across in my life. They're the bravest army that I think that's ever existed on planet Earth. Ukrainian Zesu. Boy, oh boy. These guys are inventive, they're strong, they're humorous, they're fun, they're great.
but they need your help. There are Ukrainian soldiers spending every month their entire salaries on equipping themselves and putting diesel in their cars and stuff. Not because they have to, because they want to. But we need more. We need more. We need the West to supply us. And we need Ukraine to unite behind there. So please, God bless. Thank you.